Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about five tips to help you lower your cortisol levels. And be sure to stay tuned until the end of the video because the last two actually only take about one minute. Stay tuned. Welcome to Wellness with John. I'm John Peters, and these are resources to help you thrive. So in this video, I want to talk about five tips to lower cortisol. But first, let's just talk about what cortisol is and why you should care about it. So when you have the stress response, you release cortisol into your bloodstream. And you also have varying cortisol levels during your day, typically with the highest levels in the morning and then waning for the rest of the 24-hour cycle until the next morning, right? And when cortisol is well-regulated, it actually is a, a hormone that helps us be on. So the fact that I'm actually awake enough to be making this video means that I have sufficient cortisol levels that I'm not, you know, too low energy. And we want to be awake during the parts of our day when we need to be active and focused. But we don't really want to be overstimulated with cortisol because <clears throat> it's frankly subjectively unpleasant. It's the, the hormone that drives that subjective feeling of anxiety. And we also don't want cortisol levels to be dysregulated so that they're generally too high because that can diminish sleep quality and sustained higher cortisol levels are also associated with clinical anxiety, with weight gain, with um, heart disease, and diabetes, right? So <clears throat> we know that cortisol is implicated in negative mental health and physical health conditions. So here are some tips to lower cortisol. And starting with number one, it has to do with what goes into your mouth. So some things that we eat and drink can significantly affect our cortisol levels. One is caffeine. So when you drink caffeine, you have elevated cortisol levels. It's, it's kind of part of the effect of caffeine in how we have more energy. And so if you're a regular drinker of caffeine, you are going to be elevating your cortisol levels. Now, this isn't necessarily meaning that you have to have a complete prohibition on caffeine. But what I tell my patients is, if you're having more anxiety than you want, and if you're having a stress response that's not optimal in whatever ways, it's a good idea if you're a regular caffeine drinker to consider reducing your caffeine intake. So you could experiment by lowering it by 50% and see if that actually ends up helping you feel less anxious, okay? Number two is alcohol. Some people may think this is like counterintuitive because people find that drinking is kind of is sedative and it kind of relaxes you um, and the front end. But the reality is if you look at drinkers versus non-drinkers, drinkers have higher cortisol levels. And to the extent that you're a heavier drinker, you're going to have significantly elevated cortisol levels. Um, the good news is if you lower your alcohol intake, your cortisol levels will go down. The bad news is that the research shows that it actually takes a while for that internal system to reset. If you've been a chronic heavier drinker and you've got elevated cortisol levels because of that, it could actually take a few weeks of a lower amount of drinking or not drinking for you to get back into more optimal regulation of your cortisol levels. The third thing that we, we take into our mouth that affects cortisol levels significantly is sugar. And, and especially because sugar increases cortisol, plus sugar, sugary foods tend to replace more nutritive foods. So certain foods have good nutrition to help regulate cortisol, especially things like foods with complex fatty acids. Um, and so we tend to eat less nutritive foods when we eat more sugar. And more sugar itself is going to call, cause higher cortisol. So if you have a tendency to binge on sugary foods or you just include a lot of sugary 
foods in your diet, then you might want to consider lowering that in order to feel less anxious and to prevent some of these negative physical health effects of, of cortisol. And if you haven't really taken a look at your sugar intake, it's usually kind of shocking if you look at it. For example, people don't realize that like a soda has the equivalent of 12 teaspoons of raw sugar. Uh, and some people are drinking four, six, eight sodas a day. So <clears throat> if you're drinking a lot of soda and you're not drinking diet soda, you're getting a, a, a lot of sugar, right? Now, I'm not a fan of diet soda either because I think there are other health issues. And you can Google that and find out what the complaints are about how soda in general has a negative impact on your health. But in any case, the point is that <clears throat> too much sugar in your diet is going to raise cortisol directly. It's also going to tend to replace more nutritive foods that could actually help you have a better cortisol regulation. The other thing that people sometimes take in their mouth that affects cortisol are supplements. And I'm not going to go into a deep dive here on what supplements are shown to have the most effect, but I'll just mention a couple of them. And you can, again, Google this and see what the, the discussion says online. But some people take ashwagandha, some people take lemon balm, some people take L-theanine to lower uh, cortisol levels. Um, they've been shown to work, but I think you have to be an informed consumer if you're going to take any supplement and proceed with your eyes open and hopefully with good advice from your doctor or another professional who's qualified to talk to you about that. At the very least, do your research and look for trusted sources on the topics and see what they say. But, but people do regulate their cortisol levels with supplements. Frankly, <clears throat> if you're drinking a, a lot of caffeine and or a lot of alcohol and you have a really sugary diet, I personally wouldn't recommend trying to counteract that with heroic doses of supplements because the more straightforward approach would be to just correct your diet so that you lower caffeine, lower alcohol, and cut sugar out of your diet or, or, or lower it a lot. And that's a much more straightforward way to have more natural regulation of your cortisol levels. So that's tip number one. Uh, think about what goes in your mouth. Uh, Tip number two is exercise, because the research shows that regular moderate exercise lowers cortisol levels, all right? Now, it seems to me in looking at the research on that, that the jury's out to give a definitive explanation. I think that there are multiple factors that go on in terms of how we do exercise and how it affects us. But the simple thing, even if we don't yet know all of the theories to describe the mechanisms of how it works, the reality is it works. And, you know, we can access the technology of a skill, do exercise, even before we have the full advantage of understanding exactly how it works. So, you know, I tend to encourage people to start small, even if you don't think that you can accomplish all of your fitness goals at least get into a regular pattern of some sort of moderate exercise like walking. And you're going to find that that's pretty quickly psychologically beneficial, which I actually think is one of the ways that it helps lower cortisol. It helps us mentally kind of frame how we experience ourself and our ongoing experience in a more positive way. Um, exercise is often uh, social. In, in, but even if it isn't, um, those aspects of exercise tend to help regardless of what's going on physically in our body. <clears throat> Excuse me, but, but uh, regular, you know, most days, moderate exercise has been shown to lower cortisol. If you regularly exercise, it will also affect tip number three, which is get good sleep. So part of good sleep hygiene is being active enough that your body can get tired enough to sleep. And this is shown, it's unambiguous, and you might know it in your own experience. If you do some regular exercise, you tend to sleep better. 
Now, exercise is not the only factor in sleep hygiene. Uh, you also have to reduce caffeine. You have to reduce sugary foods. You have to reduce alcohol again, like in tip number one. But there are other things that you can do for good sleep hygiene. I'm actually um, about to post a link to the worksheet that I use with my patients and my coaching clients to coach them on good sleep hygiene and effective methods to improve sleep quality. So as soon as I get that launched, you'll see a link for that down in the description. So check down there. That should be launched pretty soon. And when it is, it'll be down in the description of this video if you want to get a hold of the worksheet that I use when I work with my clients. Um, but uh, again, you can Google sleep hygiene and see what tips are in order to try to get better sleep. It's a, it's a chronic issue for a lot of people. It's also a pervasive issue. You know, people in general, if you ask them, you know, did you wake up well rested um, the last five mornings? You know, uh, most people don't say yes, all five. Most people have something less than five. And some, some groups sleep worse than others. The worst demographic being people in the United States between the ages of 18 and 24. Uh, if you're in that group, you get the worst sleep of anybody on the planet, basically. And so, so sleep hygiene is, a, is an issue for each one of us. It's a pervasive issue because of chronic poor sleep. And chronic, chronic sleep deprivation dysregulates cortisol. That's one of the outcomes. And it also tends to dysregulate other hormones, and, including serotonin. And so it affects our mood, it affects, it makes us more irritable, and it affects our mentation, it makes us less focused. So good sleep is actually a pretty essential element in general for your wellness plan. Um, <clears throat> tip number four. So tips number four and five are ways to hack your system so that you can regulate your cortisol better. And, and tip number four is the long out breath. So here's, here's a, a brain hack that's really easy to do, and it can help you if you're experiencing like a day where you're really, really elevated in your stress level, or you're having like a panic attack or an acute stress episode where you're up at code red, um, and, it's, and it's the long out breath. And, and why is it the long out breath? Because here's, here's a weird fact you may not know. You know, we have a stress response, and so if we consider all of the complex internal changes that go on when we have a perception of stress and our stress response gets elevated, the so-called fight or flight response. Sometimes we think about that only in these more acute situations, like a car pulled out in front of me and I got super stressed, okay? It's easy to kind of understand the context of when the stress response got triggered and then try to explain what goes on in my body and my brain when I had the stress response. But the reality is, the stress response is mediated by our endocrine system and our central nervous system and all of our various organs that have dynamic behaviors like your heart, which can beat fast and slow and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and all of that system is constantly going on because even if we're not talking about the stress response, we have lots of regulation going on for things like metabolism. It's also the same system that's connected into what we call feelings and emotions, right? So the system is very dynamic. It's constantly changing every millisecond of our life. And one weird fact about this is that every single time we breathe in, we actually potentiate the fight or flight response a little bit. Every time we breathe out, we potentiate the reversal of the fight or flight response, right? So you could think about this as every time I breathe in, I get a little bit more stressed. Every time I breathe out, I get a little less stressed, okay? Now we can hack that by doing a few long out breaths, right? So if you breathe in quickly, right, more quickly than you normally would, and then you breathe out slowly, longer than you normally would, and you do that for three breath cycles, you're actually gonna lower your cortisol levels. And the reason I say three breath cycles and not just keep doing it is if you keep doing that endlessly, your oxygen CO2 level is going to change enough for your brain to notice that. And you'll start to have that, I'm going to pass out or I'm hyperventilating or 
I just don't feel right kind of feeling. Uh, so in order to avoid that, just do it for three breath cycles, then let go of the practice until you're breathing normally, and then you can do three more breath cycles. And you can keep doing that, but in between each set of three, just drop the practice and let yourself breathe normally, and then you can do it again whenever you want, okay? So quick in-breath, long out-breath, right? And the last one is also something you can do in a short period of time, but for, you, for it to really work, for it to really start to uh, lower your cortisol levels and help your cortisol levels be in optimal regulation, you need to be doing it regularly, right? And that's mindful breathing. So mindful breathing simply is just relaxing your body one notch, paying attention to the breath. Don't change the breath. Let it be natural. Every single time you breathe in, silently to yourself, not out loud, in your head, you just say in, and silently in your head, when you breathe out, you just say out. So you're mindful of the breath, which means ongoing awareness without judgment. And in your head, you're just saying in when you breathe in and out when you breathe out, and you're breathing naturally, okay? That one, if you do it for one minute, you're going to lower your cortisol levels, okay? But my recommendation for my patients and my clients is do that for one minute, but do one minute of that five times at least every single day, okay? And the reason I recommend that is the short practice period is not going to be overwhelming. It's not going to get in the way of other things because it's just a short amount of time. And it's not going to make you feel like you're not doing it right. And thus you're a failure. And thus you give up and don't get the benefit. Um, plus, more frequent small sessions is actually much more beneficial for you than infrequent long sessions. So one five-minute session every day is actually not as helpful as five one-minute sessions every day. Okay. And you need to be doing this daily. And, and what I've found with my clients is that when people actually do that, within about a week to 10 days, they start sleeping better and they start reporting that subjectively they just feel generally less stressed. And they also report that when they have a stress response, it's not as negative, like they don't get as angry when they get angry, that type of thing. So I'm, I've made videos on this channel about mindful breathing. And if you want to check out the how to video, I'll put a link up here now so you can go check that out. So I uh, hope this is helpful for you. And, and I know you have a lot of things to do with your time. So I appreciate you joining me on this video today. But uh, if you have yet to subscribe to my channel, please subscribe. And if you like this kind of content, hit the like button below and stay tuned to the channel because I will continue to make content like this that helps you be the you you want to be and to help you thrive. So thanks for joining me today and I'll see you in an upcoming video.